All right, let's get started. We are reaching actually a semi conclusion. What? No way, yeah. So if you'd like, you can divide, there's different ways to divide the book up. Gentlemen, uh, chapter 1 through 24, broadly speaking, is the judgment of God against Jerusalem or Judah, the southern kingdom. There's some judgment against Israel, we did last week, um, but mostly it's against Judah from Ezekiel in exile towards those who are still left back in, in Jerusalem, okay? Um, especially the, since chapter 16. So it's 16, this is the culmination of 16 to 24. Chapter 25 through 32, which we'll start next time, are judgments against other nations. So Ezekiel is going to preach against other nations like the Ammonites and the Moabites and some others. Okay? So, um, so we'll, have the ju- we'll finish today the judgment against God's people. We'll also have the judgment against the Gentiles you know, for a, few week- for a couple months here this summer. Because right? we'll probably end up having to take a week or two off here and there. I don't know yet. I haven't looked at the schedule. So we want them to be quiet, but we fed them sugar. Hmm. I know, it's always uh, ironic. Hmm. Hmm. All right, so, um, so that, you know, this will be a happy little bit of a conclusion because it's been a little um, strenuous, although hopefully edifying for you to get to this point. We spent 28 or 30 weeks to this point. Time flies when you're having fun, right? All right. Um, and then the last part of the book, chapter 33 to the end, roughly chapter 40, is... Um, the gospel, the restoration, the renewal, the, uh, you know, the, the last time God returning his people from exile, all of that kind of language. You know, the dead bones being joined together and getting flesh, the shepherd gathering his sheep, all of that beautiful language which we love. Um, first we finish judgment against Judah, and then we'll have seven chapters of judgment against the Gentiles. They are not excluded from judgment, right? Even out of ignorance. They still have their sin, right? Yeah. All right. But of course, the whole story, we talked about this when we talked about Samaria last time, I think, is that, is the gospel for Samaritans? Clearly from both Jesus and then the apostles' ministry, we had Philip on Wednesday going out, going into Samaria, so. All right. So let's first, uh, well, this chapter is going to be in two parts. We should say that too. The first is going to be a, what do we call these things? A metaphor, if you like. All right. Or a parable. Let's say it's a parable. And then the second is going to be one of these action prophecies where Ezekiel does something and then his actions are bizarre. And so then the people want to know what they mean. You remember the action prophecies? Like when he made the little city out of the model city of Jerusalem and lay on his side. And they're like, what is wrong with the prophet? Yeah. This one's going to be pretty provocative too, I think. All right. So let's read the parable or the symbol of the cooking pot. He's looking around. He wants to know if anybody else. I was like, hmm, what if we switch things up? No, we're not switching switching things up. You're reading. Thank you. Thanks for volunteering. Okay. In the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, write down the name the name of this day, this very day. The king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. And utter a parable to the rebellious house and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Set on the pot, set it on, pour in water also, put in it the pieces of meat, all the good pieces, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with choice bones, take the choicest one of the flock, pile the logs under it, boil it well, seethe also its bones in it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose corrosion is in it, and whose corrosion has not gone out of it. Take out of it piece after piece, without making any choice. For the blood she has shed is in her midst. She put it on the bare rock. She did not pour it out on the ground to cover it with dust. To rouse my rock, take vengeance. I have set on the bare rock the blood she has shed, that it may not be covered. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city. I also will make the pile great. Heap on the logs, kindle the fire, boil the meat well, mix in the spices, and let the bones be burned up. 
Then set it empty upon the coals, that it may become hot, and its copper may burn, that its uncleanness may be melted in it. Its corrosion consumed. She has wearied herself with toil. Its abundant corrosion does not go out of it. Into the fire of its corrosion. On account of your unclean goodness, because I would have cleansed you, and you were not cleansed from your uncleanness, you shall not be cleansed any more until I have satisfied my fury upon you. I am the Lord, I have spoken, it shall come to pass. I will do it, I will not go back. I will not spare, I will not relent. For into your ways and your deeds, you will be judged, declares the Lord God. Oh, that's a little intense. Yeah. All right, so again, this is a parabolic, but he does a pretty good job explaining what's going on. First, by giving you the context, right, with the date. The ninth year of the tenth month on the tenth day of the month, which is uh, January 15th, 588 or so. It depends on how precise you want to be. Um, if you know, we actually have comparable dating from both Jeremiah and from first, Second Kings. Yeah, Jeremiah 52, Second Kings 25. So what ends up happening is, as is often the case in the ancient world, they would lay siege to a city, right? And then kill people who left, and then the people who are left inside die as well from starvation or whatnot until they finally surrender, right? And uh, the siege of Jerusalem is two and a half years. Can you imagine? Two and a half years, nothing going in or out? Yeah. So we've known about, I mean, we... We know about the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman emperor in AD. They lay siege in about 68, and it's not destroyed until AD 70. So they do it again. Rome does it again, two years siege. You know, people are eating each other because that's all they have to eat, that kind of thing. You know, once the horses are gone, and the dogs, and the cats, and the gerbils, and the, the cow. Well, the cows have been gone a long time. Yeah. Yeah, they went first. Well, it's not like you can ration out because you don't know how long. I mean, that's the whole point of a siege, right? No rationing is going to make any difference. They're just going to outlive. They're going to outweigh you. So that happens with the king of Babylon. And again, we talked about this before, but if you know the history, this is, this is because the puppet king that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Yeah, the puppet king, meaning Babylon had his hand up the back and told him what to do. He was being controlled. And then he, then he went and conspired against Babylon with Egypt. And uh, when Babylon found out, then uh, no more puppet king. Remember, he, uh, his sons were killed in front of him, and then his eyes gouged out. Yeah, this is all recorded in Second Kings, so you can go read that if you want. It's very pleasant stuff. What is the ninth, the ninth year? What is uh, Yeah, ninth year. That's a good question. As far I didn't bring my... I have a dating and Ezekiel reference, but I didn't bring it with me. Um, it's a little bit vague, but well, let's just look at Jeremiah 52, right? Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. All right. So it would be the ninth year of his reign, verse 4. In the 10th month, on the 10th day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem. So that's usually what it's referring to, right? King the ninth year the of the reign of Zedekiah, who rebelled against the king of Babylon. Make sense? All right, good. Yeah. So sometimes when I give you those cross references, they're, yeah, they're helpful. <laughs> so there they are. Um, so it's pretty precise dating. And this is really going to be the end of the thing that Israel actually asked for, which was a political, theological state, right? We call it a theocratic government. They asked for that. They didn't have one before that, right? For them, the government was the heads of the household. It was tribal. So you had the seven tribes, right? The sons of Jacob, all collectively known as Israel, but individually each tribe had their own land and they governed themselves. Right? Sometimes they would have to cooperate with each other if there was a greater enemy, but generally they, they lived unto themselves. And they were, their borders, yeah, well, anyway. Um, so then they asked for a king. They asked like, for a king like all the nations around them. And God said, no, you don't want one of those by Samuel, right? And they said, no, yes, we do. And God said, okay, then I'm going to give you exactly what you want. We've, we've read a lot of stories about God giving the people exactly what they want in Ezekiel. 
Oh, you want to be a whore? Have at it. And it doesn't go well, right? And the same thing with the kingdom. Um, Saul is not a great king. He's a, he ends up demon-possessed by the end, right? An evil spirit tormenting him because he rejects the word of the Lord. David, um, I would say, uh, best of the bunch, probably, right? Solomon, wise, but not so wise in his own marital life, of course. Then the kingdom fractures. And from then on, it's basically Hezekiah and Josiah are the only like halfway decent kings. Josiah, they're both kind of reformatory kings that can bring back worship in the temple and that kind of thing. But otherwise, the theocratic state, well, you end up worshiping, worshiping the, the krat, not the theo, if you know what those word stems are. Rather than worship God, they end up worshiping the king. Not, if not implicitly, you know, just in practicality. Because they worship the the king, the foreign gods the king sets up. Is it kind of like a theme where God is kind of like doing these mm-hmm. people more well to Yep, like yep, over and over. Yep, yep, yep. Which uh, might be a little indicting for us. You know, like I said, we should be ashamed of our government, not just be like, hey, whatever. Because if we say whatever, then he's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> right? If we, but if we pray to him and say, uh, no, not this. No, not that. You know, then he can cut them down. He will cut them down. For our sake, for the prayer of, we'll say, how many people are in here? 12 righteous people or something. 15 righteous people. All right. So, 10th month. Good question. Was it 10th month? Yeah, 10th month, 10th day. We have the word formula. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, write down the name of this day, this very day. So the king of Babylon started his siege at Jerusalem this very day. So it has a name. We'll call it siege day. Kind of like V-day, I guess. Or V-E day or... What are some other ones? D-Day. Yeah, there's another one. Except this is, uh, we'll call it Conquering Day (laughs) or something. All right. Uh, Let's see. So then we have the, uh, yeah, we actually have a little bit of prophetic word, right? The siege is going to be laid, and then, then the parable is actually prophesying the complete destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. That's the setup. Pretty straightforward, right? We've talked about parables. Sometimes they're vague and you can't really see what's going on. Um, kind of like what happened with Nicodemus, right? He's like, what are you talking about, Jesus? And we hear it and we're like, he's talking about baptism, Nicodemus. What's your problem? We're like, yeah, but we have, ba- we have baptism, right? I have a question about that. Yeah. So, you know how like the Roman, the centurion, like once Jesus Died and he saw, you know, he, yeah, truly this man was the son of God. Yeah, that what happened with That's why he came to Jesus. Yep, because of the signs he did. Okay. Yeah. But like he didn't see when Jesus was alive. Uh-uh. But then, yeah, that's, I didn't explicitly say it, but that's what I implied. Yeah. Is that Nicodemus comes, not until he sees the dead son of God does he believe. Yeah. Right, and that's connected then. Death is a huge theme in baptism. We always, we always remember the life part, but we forget about the dying first. <laughs> right? Okay. Good question. All right, so this is a parable to the rebellious house, or the house of rebellion, which is Israel, of course, or Judah, Jerusalem in particular. Thus says the Lord God. So then we have the parable, right? And I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we've had the pot before, the cooking pot. Do you remember that? You do remember? I forgot it entirely. Ezekiel 11. Yeah, here it is. Uh, and he said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give wicked counsel in the city, who say, the time is not near to build houses. This city is a cauldron, and we are the meat. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. Yeah. We, when we read that, I think we said, that's a little bit vague. What are they talking about? Right? Yeah. They, they're, it's it's the, the heads or the princes of the people who say they are the meat. Now, this is the interpretive key then for us in 26. So when it says, put on a pot, set it on, right? Pour water into it, gather pieces of meat in it. Well, who are the pieces of meat? All of them. The princes, nobody's going to escape this. Even the choice cuts, meaning the... Yep, the good ones. All right, all of them go in there. And they're going to... Boil it well and let cuts simmer in it, which is also, 
Um, there's something, I don't want to say it's uh, desecration. That's too strong a word. But remember, like with the Passover lamb, you weren't to boil it. You were to roast it. Right? And you know that boiled meat is kind of gross. Unless it's like <laughs> boiled in beer. You don't boil it in water, though, right? Or you can. What do you boil in boiled meat? You can do that with brisket, right? Which brisket do you boil or simmer? Is that corned beef that you simmer? Oh, uh, okay. Well, that's pretty, that's okay. But you've already done all sorts of stuff to it, and it's not a choice cut of meat. That's the whole point. All right, you're gonna take a, you're gonna take a nice steak here. We'll say it's a, what's your favorite cut? You like a ribeye. Ribeye, yeah. So you're gonna, you're gonna take the ribeye and you're just gonna throw it in a pot and boil it. You're like, what a waste. Exactly. So you're supposed to think that. There's, there's nothing new. I mean, as far as cooking meat, barbecue. This is what, you know, remember Cain and Abel? Oh, they do. Anyway, it's right from the beginning. So you got the thigh and the shoulder. So you, what is this? The Boston butt and the, <laughs> remember all the names for the cuts? But that's on a pig, though. They would not have put a pig in there. We'll say they put the pig in there. Why not? The thigh. What's the thigh called? The whole thigh? Leg. Well, it's, we just usually call it the leg because you don't eat the, the hawk, right? You just eat the... Yeah, anyway. I'm sorry. I came from Indiana where it was all pig, pig cuts, not beef. Anyway. Uh, oh, we have the choice of the flock. So it's sheep, right? And boil it well. Boil it until... It's flavorless, basically, right? Until it falls apart. Yeah. All right. And, so that's the parable. It's only a couple of verses. And you can see New King James does it, does it right. It's poetic. So it's prophecy, but it's in song. So, therefore, thus says the Lord God. So then we have, we actually have two interpretations, but it's like Jesus said. Um, what's the greatest commandment? The Lord, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, strength and mind. And then he says, a second is like it, meaning the same. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? Same thing here. We have one interpretation. Then we have a second one that's, it's the same thing, but it's a little different. All right. The kids aren't distracting, are they? What kids? Good. I like it. Woe to the bloody city. We've had that language before for Jerusalem. So a lot of this language we're just pulling in from previous chapters. The pot whose scum is in it. Ew, so it's, it's a gross, it's got the, what kind of, the scummy pot, like the ones the kids leave behind that they use. We have cast iron, so they use the cast iron and then they don't clean it out. And it's got all this crusty stuff in it. Yeah. I like corrosion better. We could, we could call it rusty if you want. Yeah, that's good. That's actually probably a better translation from the Hebrew. And whose corrosion is not gone from it. So you're not going to be able to eat this meat either because you're using a rusty, worn-out pot. Bring it out piece by piece on which no lot has fallen. And that's a little bit odd. They give you some other examples. Oh, yeah. So there's that story. Cast lots for my people. But in other words... Uh, piece by piece, meaning every piece that went in, it's coming out and being judged as well on the way out. No one's escaping the judgment. And each receives, just as faith is received individually, but then you're brought into the, the faith, the corporate faith. So the judgment against Jerusalem is received by the city, but also on each person individually too for their own participation. All right. And, uh, yep, her, and then her blood is in her midst. Then he does this odd thing with the blood. So I think I gave you some notes about this. But um, they take the blood and sets it on top of a rock rather than pouring it out on the ground and covering it with dust. Um, I gave you the text from Leviticus on this, also Deuteronomy. Uh, but it's Leviticus 17. I suppose we have time to look at it. This is not a long story. So Leviticus 17, verse 10. And following, there it is. 
And whatever man or house of the house of Israel or of strangers who dwell among you who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood. We've talked about that before. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you. And then, uh, what was the other text I gave you? Yeah, because it comes up here again. Oh, here's the part I wanted to read for you. And whatever man of children of Israel or of strangers who dwell among you. So by the way, if you live among Israel, you have to do what Israel does. So the, the cultic life of Israel also then is participated in by sojourners, right? And uh, wayfarers and whatever. So by the way, if you go across our, our southern border or northern border into our country illegally, you still have to obey the laws of our country, right? You have to do the things we do. You have to be normalized as a citizen, all that kind of stuff, right? There's rules. That's expected, <laughs> maybe, by some. All right, anyway, this is the same thing here. Who hunts and catches any animal or bird that may be eaten, he shall, here's the key, pour out its blood and then cover it with dust for the life of all flesh. For it is in the life of all the flesh. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood sustains its life. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, don't eat the blood, but then also the blood that's poured out needs to be covered. Right? And then you can also think of like uh, Genesis, Abel's blood cries out for vengeance. Why? Sounds like his blood was uncovered. That when he was slain, the blood was just, Cain just left the blood of his brother and the blood was crying out. Whereas if you cover it with dust, maybe it would be silent. I don't know. I was, I was going to ask if this ties into even earlier in Genesis when um, really Adam is, is cursed to become once again dust. Well, you have the shedding of blood, but I mean, everybody knows to do this anyway. Like if you're a deer hunter, right? And you dress the animal in the field, you don't, you cover up all the entrails and everything, right? In the blood. You bury it. Anybody hunting here? Nobody's a hunter? Oh, okay. Oh, if you just leave the pile there? Well, you wouldn't want to do it in your backyard because you're going to attract other animals. Okay. Well, in this case, if you leave the blood uncovered, it's going to attract more predators, right? Which is what happens to Jerusalem. Um, so she, who is she, the bloody city, did, did not pour it on the ground to cover it up with dust. She, she, her blood, she set on top of a rock. So even as her dead were being slain, she still left it all out for the world to see. This is connected. We talked about this with the, uh, with the whore picture too, right? With the, um, you know, with, with her fluids and how she wasn't ashamed of them being just going all over the place. It's the same idea. That it may raise up fury and take vengeance. I have set her blood on top of the rock that it may not be covered, right? So that's what she wanted to do. And so then God says, okay, we're just blood everywhere. And that's literally what happens to Jerusalem. It's wiped out. No one, you know, they only leave a very small remnant after that final destruction and not in the city, not in the city, just for the farmland, you know, and for the flocks. Actually, that's not even right. Nebuchadnezzar sets up other people to care for the flocks. He does, he even, he deports all the, all the people of Judah. Okay, before we go to the second. Yeah. Like I, I, I see here through you, bro, like allusion to safety and security. Before I read this, like, yeah. I thought, might the choice Christ of me, and like, um, like the, and the choice of the flock, that tied into um, Israel as God's chosen people, but because. Uh, because of their sin, you know, they're put in this dusty pot and boiled, and now they're disgusting because of what they did. Right. Yeah, no, I think so. I don't know if you all understood what Ethan's getting after, but the idea is, is I have that second paragraph talking about, I mean, this sounds like a meal being prepared, but it's kind of a, it's, it's not a pleasant, it's not a good meal, right? It's not the bones rich with marrow, you know, and the 
choice cuts. That's an Isaiah, right? But this is the people themselves are being consumed and it's some kind of almost like it's a sacrifice is what it is, right? But um, they're offering themselves up for a sacrifice. But of course, it's not the chosen sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice that can take away sins. It doesn't atone for them. They just die and they're dead, right? They need an atonement. They need, it's always, a, it's the substitutionary atonement is what they need. The sinless dying for the sinful, right? Which doesn't come until later. We have to wait for later in the book. Good question, Ethan. All right, good on the first interpretation. The second one just amps it up a little bit. Now we find out that it's actually, okay, in the first one, Jerusalem's doing this to herself. She's the one setting the fire. She's the one boiling her own people, right? She's laying out the blood. And then at the end it said, well, God said, yeah, I'll let her do that. In the second interpretation, he says, you know what, who's actually behind all of that? I am. All right, which is, we've talked about this with, um, and I mentioned it in the prayer of the church today. Like, we believe that Jesus is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And the implication of that confession is that those who govern over us are doing so under God's direction. But if they're doing so to bring us hurt and harm, if they're doing, if they're taking things from us, then what is God doing? That's the uncomfortable question, right? It's like, what? Yeah, well, he's taking from us the things that we put our fear, love, and trust in that weren't him. And Esther? Stop. All right. So, second one. Woe to the bloody city. I, too, as well, will make the pyre great. Did we read this? No. We didn't read the second one yet? Well, I, I read it. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Heap on the wood. Kindle the fire. All right, so now this is even more intense, right? Cook the meat well. Mix in the spices and let the cuts be burned up. So they're not just boiled, but they're consumed by the fire. You have a couple things in mind here, I think. We have the, uh, the meat pots in Egypt. Did we, have we talked about the meat pots in Egypt? That the people, when they're in the wilderness, they're like, oh, we had the pots full of meat in Egypt. It was so nice. And now we have this worthless man, uh, manna. The meat pots in Egypt were in the temples to the false gods. They're talking about longing for the temple sacrifices, the cultic sacrifices of Egypt. We've had that in, in Ezekiel, and we've had some question about that. Like, why did God kept saying that they increased their transgressions in Egypt. But in, in the Bible, we go from the end of Genesis to the beginning of Exodus, and it's 400 years, and, we, and nothing's recorded. We don't know what's been happening in Egypt for 400 years. But we can, we can actually, it's implied by the way they talk about their life in Egypt, that they want to go back to the religious life of Egypt. They even set up the golden calf to mimic that. We talked about last week, I think, or two weeks ago. Right, so we have the, we have the, the meat pots, which are a sacrificial thing, cultic sacrifice. Um, but we also have the, the sacrifice being consumed, probably reminds you of prophet, which prophet? And everything's consumed, including the, the stones and the water and the earth. That's with Elijah, right? And the prophets of Baal. Yeah. So there's a connection here. This is a prophetic action. This is what God does with the sacrifices that are offered. Burned up. Although there's spices in it this time. What we call these? Burnt ends. Yeah, barbecue, you know, the burnt ends? Yeah, okay. So there's I death. Think, I think I, li- I like the translation here better than the ESV. It says fire rather than just pile. Which oh, yeah. Which really ties in, uh, honestly, yeah. with the, the sacrifice, but also, like, they're being killed and buried. Right. Right. And I think we can also look forward to um, the, co- the consuming fire of God's wrath that's, that's put, poured out on the bloody city. Ultimately, all of that ends up being poured out on Jesus at the cross. So he talks about this in uh, Luke 12, I think, about a baptize, or with a, 
The baptism that I'm going to be baptized with, you can't be baptized with? Uh, Dorothy, don't do that, please. Dorothy. Dorothy. Cut it out. You too. Is it? Mm. Mm. Did I put it on here, maybe? On the sheet? Nope, didn't. No, I did. It is Luke 12. I just didn't go far enough. Look at that. Uh, there it is. I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five and one house will be divided, three against two, two against three, right? But there's this baptism that I'm to be baptized with, and it's fire on the earth, right? So he's not baptized with water. He's baptized with fire, right? The fire of God's wrath. He is baptized with water too, but sometimes Jesus has these multiple overlapping things going on. Dorothy. Thank you. All right. So uh, then set the empty pot on the coals. So we've talked about this actually with Luke's gospel, but it's, there you have the first interpretation and then he ratches it up a notch. That's called in, in biblical uh, reading, we call it step typology. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's just a higher step. Or, you know, he cranks it up to 11, we'll say. Then set the, empty, the pot empty on the coals that it may become hot and its bronze may burn that its filthiness or corrosion, we said, yeah, may be melted in it that its corrosion may be consumed. So it's actually worse. The whole pot's being burned up here, not just the meat within it. She has grown weary with lies or toil, and her great scum or corrosion has not gone from her. Let her corrosion be in the fire. So now we find out that the, the reason for the fire, or the fuel for the fire, it's not just the wood, the kindling, but it's actually her own wickedness is the reason why she's being burned up. And that's what's fueling the fire. Okay? That makes sense though, right? Well, it doesn't have to make sense, but that's what it says. <laughs> it's, a, it's a parable. In your filthiness and looseness is, is lewdness because I have cleansed you and you were not cleansed. So that harkens back to chapter 16, if you remember. That was with the, with the abandoned baby girl, that whole parable, right? Left in her own blood, and then he raises her up and clothes her like a princess, but then she rejects that, and she becomes the whore, right? And then he cleanses her, but then she rejects that too. <laughs> All right? So we have the first cleansing is probably what's in mind here when she was a baby. So I cleansed you, and that's a story throughout all the Bible. We forget about this. There's no chosen people. I mean, there is a chosen people, but they're constantly being rechosen, if you like. Abraham's called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Moses is called, right? They don't even know. By the way, that is in Exodus. They don't even know who God is until, and Moses comes and says, his name is I Am. And they're... So that, that begs the question, why were they in Egypt? Because they had rejected God. Yeah. yeah. And the promise. They've forgotten the God of their, of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They weren't looking forward to the promise. They didn't even want to go home. They'd rather be slaves. Ugh, terrible. Right. Uh, how did I get to that? Oh, over and over in the Bible, it's God continually calling. If you like, out of Egypt, I have called my son. You hear that with Matthew at the verse story. Jesus even goes into Egypt, but he comes back. Right? Unlike God's people. This will happen with Babylon when they try to do the restoration. There's a lot of people are like, hey, you know what? Matt now understands this. I set up my business here, right? My kids are married with Babylonians now. It's like, why would I leave? I'm like, well, it's better. Yeah. Really? I have to move. Have you ever had to move 2,000 miles? It doesn't sound pleasant, especially in the ancient world, does it? <laughs> yeah, that's a, lot of, that's a big caravan. All right. Uh, you will not be cleansed of your filthiness anymore till you have till I have caused my fury to rest upon you. And I think there's a little bit of good news there. <laughs> there's a little bit of good news. What's the good news? In, in verse 13. I don't know if I wrote it down. Nope. Uh, 
You will not be cleansed of your filthy more till I have caused my fury to rest upon you. Rest meaning? No, there's an end. Yeah, there's an end to the judgment. Well, ultimately death. And then it's done, right? Finally at rest. No. Yeah, no, there's good news here because later on he's going to, what is he going to do with the dry bones in, in the wilderness? Raise them up. Yeah, exactly. Of course, you know that. You hear it in faith. I'm not sure they heard that. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass. I will do it. Notice who's the subject here? Who's the subject? I, the Lord. So who's doing the verbs? The Lord. Right. He spoke it. He will cause it to come to pass. He will do it. He will not hold back. He will not spare. He will not relent. Um, And then, as we said before, why? Or how? In what manner? According to your deeds. According to your ways. In other words, I'm giving you exactly what you wanted. And it, but it will be God's wrath and fury. And they will judge you. Your ways and deeds will judge you. Says the Lord God. The end. Oh, that's kind of sad. Right? So that, that's one way of doing it with a parable. And then we're going to do it with, now with an action prophecy. Who wants to read this? Nice and loud. This one's not too hard. Verse 15. Yeah, right top. Also the word of the Lord came saying, Son of man, behold, take away from you the desire of your eyes one stroke, that you shall neither mourn nor weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh in silence, make no mourning for your death. Bind your servant on your head and put your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your lips and do not eat men who bread of sorrow. So I spoke to the people in the morning and at the evening my wife died. The next morning I said, I was commanded. And the people said to me, Will you not tell us what these things signify? Do you agree? Do you hate so? All right, hold up there. All right, so you see what's happening here. The desire of your eyes, meaning we find out later is your wife. So the same day his wife dies, as he gives that previous prophecy. And it's the day that the king of Babylon lays siege, and his wife dies the same day. Now, there's all sorts of um, both expected but also prescribed um, ritual for burial, right? Karen knows about these things, right? When you have a family member die, you, you get reminded of all the things you're supposed to do, right? Uh, we have to set a time. We have to, we have to handle this and that. We have to talk about the will. We have to do. I don't know how involved you are with all of that. I was there to make the arrangements. Yeah, you were there to make the arrangements, right? Yeah, because the brother would usually be the one making the arrangements, right? But in this case, that's your brother that died. Um, and there's all sorts of like cultural expectations that there is a visitation, right? And that and that you show up and that people greet you and that you have to shake everyone's hand as torturous as that is and. You know, I think it's difficult. It's not easy. Same thing for them. They have, and we see this like at the time of Jesus, they have rites and rituals. There's things you do. Like the widow's son dies, they take the casket and they hire mourners and they carry the casket out and there has to be weeping and wailing. These are, she has to be dressed in black, the whole deal. A lot of that stuff is still around, right? You still wear black at a funeral kind of thing. But the Lord tells Ezekiel, I'm going to strike your wife dead today. And you have to act like it didn't happen. You have to ignore whatever cultic rules there are, the, that are Levitical laws, but also any kind of cultural stuff too. Expectations. Which, it's a pretty hard job for the prophet, right? I mean, we don't know how long he's been married. We don't know anything. There's very actually, there's some comments on the sheet about this. There's very little about Ezekiel's personal life that we've talked about. Now we find out he was married. We know he was trained as a priest. That's about it. Um, by the way, marriage with the prophets is kind of hit or miss. Some are married, some aren't. Same thing with the apostles. Some are, some aren't. Peter is probably a widower. He had a wife because he had a mother-in-law, right? But his wife isn't mentioned, so... And he's taking care of his mother-in-law, so it sounds like she died. His wife died. Which frees him up to do all his missionary journeys, I guess. Road trip! Uh, road trip. Right. Yeah, I was reminded... Isaiah was married, by the way. His children are named in his book. Yeah. I was reminded here of um, what um, what David is told to do when 
Yeah, the sun correct. With the son of the adultery with Bathsheba. Remember David? He does like the opposite of what you expect. He's grieving, he's weeping for the son while he's dying, but then once his son dies, then he washes his face, he anoints his, he anoint, washes and anoints, he puts on clean clothes, and he worships. And the people are like, what? Right? But, but actually, that's a great example. David's way of worshiping is the way a Christian would worship at, at a death. I mean, funerals are hard this way, but we'll be in church, right, um, for David, and there'll be, there's weeping and, and sorrow, but there's also joy and, and hope in the resurrection at the same time. That doesn't mean you can't cry. You can cry. But, but they're a mixture, right? Um, how does the Bible talk about this? You will weep tears of joy. Like, it's like, wait a minute, why are you crying? Because I'm... And it's both. It's both at the same time. Apparently they wore turbans too. Well, he's in Babylon. When in Babylon, dressed like a Babylonian. Yeah, it's true. All right, so he's going to do this, and this, of course, is going to freak everybody out. Because, like, what's wrong with you? And I don't think this is the same as David, where David is confessing the resurrection. Because they ask him, why aren't you acting like a normal grieving person? And what does he say? My, my son is gone, but I will see him again. Oh, he cannot come to me, but I can go to him. Well, I think that's how he says it. The consequences here are This is different. Yep. Although that's true for Ezekiel too. All right. So he spoke to the people in the morning that his wife was going to die, or with the parable we just heard, right? And maybe this part too. And in the evening, his wife died. And the next morning, I did what I was commanded. Just like matter of factly. Yeah, well. Yeah. say, like, I mourned after that for a while. I was deeply sad and just like that. Right. And clearly the people see what he's doing as a sign. This is something. The prophet is acting weird. We got to ask him, why are you doing it? So when pastor comes in, maybe I show up in church and I'm wearing a clown outfit. You're going to ask, pastor, what is the sign? What are you signifying? Will you not tell us what these things signify? Why are you putting a clown costume? It would wake you up a little bit, right? And I'll be like, I, I can't even think of, I don't know. It's such an absurd example. This is a prophecy against your job. <laughs> Speaking of, give any man enough rope. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think we want to make a clown of the ministry. Be clown the ministry. Yeah. But it's true. I mean, people do that. If you're into clowns, it's okay. Although I think the clowns are actually a epigenetic memory of the Nephilim. But that's another story. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's cross-cultural. Everybody, yeah. There's clowns in many cultures. And, and they freak people. And they always freak people out, too. Yeah, scary clowns. Yeah, scary clowns. All right, <laughs> never mind. Uh, tell us what these things signify. Why do you behave so? Good, 20. You want to keep going, Matt, or you want to let somebody oh, sure, else hear? Yeah. Uh, so then I answered them, the word of the Lord came to me saying, speak to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will give you into the hand of the Yeah, I think this is the, is this the first time that Ezekiel has referred to himself in the third person? I don't remember having Ezekiel referring to himself in the prophecy, right? So Ezekiel here is an action prophecy, we said. He's doing these things as a testimony as to what they will be doing. Mm -hmm. Exactly like that, yep. I will profane my sanctuary your arrogant boast, the desire of your eyes, the delight of your soul, which is a hard thing to hear. That God's actually the one responsible 
for desacralizing the temple. Right? Deconsecrating, if you like. Desecrate is to deconsecrate. To take, and this is going to happen when he removes his presence, which is an interesting point, which we haven't really talked about too much. But despite the fact that most of the people are in exile in Babylon, the, God's presence still is dwell, he's saying is still dwelling in that temple, even though they also have the, remember the false idol that was set up in there? The big woman statue, gold woman statue, and, and all the little, sta- all the little I, I, idols that were in the storage room and all of that stuff we saw. Despite all that, God was still with them. He was just set in opposition to the false god. Right? Now he's saying, this is the end. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withdraw my presence from that place. And when I withdraw my presence, also I'm going to send Babylon to destroy it. Right? And that's, that's, the, um, that's supposed to be the, I don't want to say horror, but it's certainly awkward, is that when Herod rebuilds the temple, one, why did Herod rebuild it? Did Herod have authorization from God to rebuild the temple? Um, it's, never, it's never like the temple was under Solomon and following. Or even, even when it was restored to its faithfulness under Josiah. Um, this, the temple that Jesus goes into does not have the dwell. It, it has God's word, that's it. But it doesn't have that glory cloud ever. The sacrifices are not authorized by God. All of that is done. And that's why he destroys it again. When he says you shall neither mourn nor weep, you shall neither mourn. But then he says you shall mourn with one another. Mm-hmm. He's saying don't be a mourn anymore. Well, he's saying you won't be. Yeah, I mean you're going you're going to. He's talking about the, their light, what their life's going to be like in Babylon for those seventy years until they're sent, until they're able to go back home. That they'll they'll be lamenting or you know mourning. Um, but they won't be weeping. See, the, the problem is, is like, okay, so what if you lose the temple? Have they been reusing the temple in the way that God intended? Have they been receiving the gifts that God had appointed for their... No. So how, why are you going to weep? Maybe just because you lost... It'd be like if the World Trade Center got blown up or something. It'd be like, oh, we lost the World... I mean, it was kind of a majestic building. Isn't it kind of like the definition of hell? God is not in presence? That's exactly what it is. Yep. Well, I think it's the best definition, actually. I say, what's hell like? Uh, whenever God, yeah, is not pre- uh, not present to protect, preserve. But in this case, they're going to be pining away and mourning with one another over their sins. But they're not going to be not going to be weeping over over the sanctuary, which is another judgment against them, isn't it? Now, again, does is Ezekiel weeping over? Don't do that, please. Is he weeping over the death? I mean, does he want to weep over the death of his wife? Yeah, and eat the bread of sorrow and do all the mourning stuff. Of course he does. But God has withheld that, or told, withheld him from doing that as a sign because Ezekiel's wife is the sign then of the sanctuary. So the way that Ezekiel doesn't even seem to be grieving over the loss of the sanctuary, so they won't either. They'll be like, eh, we're in Babylon. And it does look that way. Like if you read Daniel, they pray towards Jerusalem. But just Daniel and his, his three friends, everybody else seems to be just hunky-dory hanging out in Babylon. And maybe in one sense. But the primary place where they would hear God's word was the sanctuary, right? And then when they return, what do they set up? Because rightly, most of the people reject the temple. Not everybody. They set up synagogues. So then this whole, a whole new religion is founded when they come back of hearing God's word without the gifts of, of the sacrifices. Now, some, some are pious and go to Jerusalem for the sacrifices. Jesus and his family are notable. Come here, Dorothy. Okay. Right. So that, that's, this is what's going on here. The sacrifice... The, the, of the sanctuary, all of that stuff is going to go away and they're not even going to weep over it. If you wondered why today's Jews don't seem to be all that concerned about rebuilding the temple, that's the reason why. Because, well, we have the Bible. We have the scriptures. Why do we need to do any of the Levitical stuff anymore? The temple's gone. It's done. It's put, been brought to an end. Not completed in Jesus, for them, like we believe, 
But rather, yeah, God, God destroyed it, so eh, I guess he's not worried about that anymore. Which is also then why a secular Jew lives as if God's word doesn't really matter and uh, as if they can do whatever they want anyway. So don't go that way, Esther, please. All right. And you, son of man, will it not be in the day when I take from them their stronghold, their joy and their glory, the desire of their eyes, and that on which they set their minds, or if you prefer, first article, or excuse me, first commandment, fear, love, and trust in God, right? Where they set their minds, their sons and their daughters. On that day, one who escapes will come to you to let you hear it with your ears. On that day, your mouth will be open to him who has escaped. You shall speak and no longer be mute. Thus you will be assigned to them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. All right, so this last three verses may even be belong to the next chapter. Because the previous one, verse 24, ended the way typically the oracles end, right? And you shall know that I am the Lord God. The end. So there's some dispute as to whether these verses belong with that or they belong with the next chapter. But here is another little gospel word, right? Just wait. Ezekiel is going to open his mouth and speak. Wait a minute. What has he been doing? All right. So what, what, is he, what does the Lord God mean here? What does Yahweh mean? Open his mouth with what? It's with a new word is what he means. All right. So that's the judgment. The end, right? And you're like, no, that's not how you end a sermon, Pastor. <laughs> and I will judge you. And you will know that I am the Lord your God. Have fun. <laughs> no, you know there's, there has to be more. Because the whole story of the Bible has been he's gracious and merciful and kind and long-suffering and patient and restorative and he brings healing. and What? What's, what? It can't end there. And so he actually says to them, when everything is taken from you that you put your trust in, Right? The stronghold with its joy and glory, that's Jerusalem. The desire of their eyes, that's the sanctuary. That which they set on their minds, their sons and their daughters, right? Whatever they put their fear, love, and trust in that isn't God. On that day, the one who, one who escapes, that's Ezekiel, right? Will come to you to let you hear it with your ears. And it will open and you shall speak and no longer be moon, mute. And thus you will be assigned to them and they shall know that I am the Lord. And here I would suggest it's in grace and mercy. But that, you're going to have to wait for that until chapter 33. Because Ezekiel has to do a bunch of prophecy against the other nations, too. All right, the Gentile nations. Yeah, like, like the Ammonites. Right? Yeah. Well, and they, their, their judgment is more severe because... And his gifts. Yeah, they've, they've rejected... We talked about this this morning with the ladies in catechesis. That... Um, that it's different, because we were actually talking about, I didn't actually do the stream live today. We recorded the service, and I'm going to broadcast it later. And it's a little bit of psychological manipulation, but um, there is something to be said for, if you can't be here, you'll watch it whenever if you care about hearing God's word, right? You know, you can watch it later in the day, you'll get, or on a tape, or later in the week, or whatever. This happens with the congregation of prayer, right? Maybe you can't join us live in the morning, but if you can watch or listen to it later in the day, you do. Because you want to, you want to, you care about the word. Yes, you'd like to be there in the moment, but not always. Uh, the divine service is different than that, because unlike the congregation of prayer, we gather in person, too, to hear his word. We comfort and we need each other. It's hard to do responsive, like male-female things if men and women aren't there, <laughs> right? Also, if there's a hiccup in the screens, right? Anyway, that's fine. Nothing's perfect. Um, but, but the biggest reason is, of course, the sacrament of the altar you don't receive by watching a stream. You can't. There's, there's no benefit to the Lord's Supper without you eating and drinking it. Comment? Yeah. Oh no. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have a problem with technology and using technology and the asynchronous, like meeting daily for prayer, 
uh, in person. I mean, I'd love to do that, but I also recognize pra the practicality of that. Um, so I, using the technology there is one thing, but, but the Bible is also very clear. Don't forsake the gathering together, right? Uh, and so there's a way, because it, you know, this story sounds very familiar. So preparing this is why I made that comment, in that they, they want the church, but they don't want the church. If that makes sense? They like the building to be here, and maybe want, there are people who would, you know, maybe, I don't know, they're going to die someday, and they need a funeral, or whatever. They want the burial plot, or there's things that they would like, or maybe they even like to hear God's word, but they don't, but they don't want to gather with you people. I don't know, maybe, have any, maybe you've offended them. Have you, Dor Esther, leave her alone. Just walk away. You two need to stay apart the whole time. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, and I think some of that was just training. I mean, we, we listened to um, secular authorities telling us that, oh, virtual worship is as good as in person. We're like, no. Um, well, and virtual is even a distorted word in and of itself. Well, virtue just means, because it comes from veer, meaning man. So they say it's virtual, meaning it's actually incarnate. That's what they're saying. That virtual, they're misusing the word virt virtual should mean in person. But we're using it in, its op in an opposite way as to what it actually means. I thought it was like virtually, like almost, not No, virtually means according to man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and then, so it's okay. Some people it's ignorance. Some people it's willful ignorance. Right? Some people it's willful rejection of the Lord's Supper. So everybody's going to be in a different position on this. But like I said, we're playing, it's a little bit of a game, but we're going to see what happens. You know, who's going to speak up and say, hey, I missed the stream. And be like, oh, we missed you. You know? And he's like, well, but I couldn't be there. Okay, fine. Right? I'll come and visit you. Because that would be what's supposed to happen. Pastor, I miss church. You know, I can't, I can't come. I, you know, I broke my leg or something. or I don't know, whatever. It sounds terrible. Well, Matt, I will tell you, in my conversations, um, it was, it's, it's almost always completely, I don't want to say completely. It's just stupid things. It's just stupid things. Like, oh, I had, it's like Jesus' parable. Oh, you know, I married a wife. Oh, I've got work to do. I got a new, I got a new cow. Right? Oh, the tractor's broke. You know, whatever. It's like you can't spare, you can't come spend an hour and a half with hearing God's word. The tractor will be there when you get back. It's not going to be, but there's only so many hours in the day. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, I don't know. What word do you recommend instead of virtual? Virtual meaning Fake? Yeah. Yeah. What do they call it? Virtual meat? They call it fake meat. What? Virtual reality. Fake reality. It's fake reality. Yeah. 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 I know it's a little bit indicting, but because we like the technology and we like the use of it, and there is an appropriate use of it. Like we had the tape ministry, right? We took tapes to Homebound, and none of, nobody thought that's the same thing. But there is something about adding video, where people think it's more real. And when you get your new Apple headset, which they'll announce on Monday. Yeah, right. Uh huh. Where it's augmented or virtual reality, both. They're, they're, well, I mean, Meta has one, Facebook. There's people that have these things, Oculus, right? But Apple's is supposedly going to be superior to everything ever. You can even put prescription lenses in it so that you can, so it's like you're wearing glasses. Anyway. Um, will it be the same thing? Is there a time and place for it? Maybe for people who are 4,000 miles apart and they want to be a little closer. But maybe the better use of your money and your time is to just buy the plane ticket and go and visit and spend the week or something with them. And they're, you know. Because what's interesting, that absence makes the hearts grow fonder is a saying, but yet it doesn't seem to apply to this. It's like when the kids have study school or three oldest 
they were just like, that wasn't good for them. They were so happy to get back to school. Right. Yeah, and I understand not... I got myself in trouble for calling virtual school fake school with one of the teachers. Because, like, we tried our best. And I'm like, yeah, I know you did. But, I, but you have to admit, and they do, that it wasn't the same thing. It wasn't even halfway. So. Not in school because I can't see right. well, but, but just substitute something else in and say, well, instead of having to listening to Jesus teach us his word, you know, it'd be like saying, well, you know, we're just going to substitute your parents with robots because it's just as good as the real thing. We can virtually feed you and virtually teach you and virtually parent you. And the robots are probably actually easier to get along with than your parents. <laughs> At least they're predictable, unlike your parents. Yeah. Anyway, we'll try it out. We'll see what happens. Right? But it's like this. I can't... Bible class... I tried to do it online, but it's really just me talking at you. (laughs) You can put some comments in, but... This is totally different. Yeah. Right. So, good. Thanks Thanks for being here. Makes Makes it more fun. Interesting. And uh, we'll get we'll get the handle of the schedule eventually. The bells have to ring. Sugar free don't no. 